Hello well, and welcome to this talk. It's getting on for the end of March 2023. Now, for some time, I've been getting increasingly concerned about the amount of research virology going on around the world in gain-of-function research. And there's two things that have brought this to the fore. It turns out that Imperial College London, this is in London, <laughs> an urban setting, had been carrying out uh, um, research on SARS coronavirus 2 combining Delta and Omicron infection, which, as we'll see, is a potentially dangerous thing to do. And the other thing that's brought it to my attention is King's College London have brought together a, a recent report highlighting the dangers of, of these uh, these type of experiments. So let's have a look at this now. Now, I must say I'm pretty surprised and, uh, well, more than surprised, really, about, about this information that's come to the fore through the Daily Telegraph. British experiments. Now, note, this is not um, some dodgy lab in uh, country X funded by some dodgy funder in country Y. This is England. This is Britain, the British Isles. What, what, what are things coming to, Re really, really? Um, the, the, the risks here are just completely unacceptable in my view. But anyway, let's keep it cognitive and look at this. Now, um, risks making the COVID pandemic more lethal. Is this true? Now, this is testing done in Imperial College London. Uh, so the experiments took place in London, as we said, in this rather urban setting, supported by the UK Health Security Agency. So this was Imperial College London, paid for by the, uh, basically by the, the, the National Health Service, the UK uh, Health Security Agency. Money that I would have thought could have been used in, in A&E departments or intensive care units or paying more nurses and doctors. But hey, you know, what, what do I know? I would have thought that might have been a better place to use the money. Um, cells were infected with Delta and Omicron at the same time. And the risk here is that we get co-infection. We can get mingling of the RNA of both of these viral types. Indeed, we know that this has happened. Where the mingling took place, of course, we don't know, but we know it's happened. We, we assumed it took place in co-infected people, and that's, that's probably where it did take place. But here they were doing that deliberately, um, quite incredible, really. They were doing that deliberately at the same time to see which had a competitive advantage. You know, it's a bit like a race. Well, I wonder who's going to win. Isn't this interesting? Let's see who's got a competitive advantage. Wouldn't it be fun? You know, what is the practical outcome of this? It really is, you know, is, is, is this just academic science for its own sake or has this got some practical outcome? Um, let, let, let's... let's you have some opinion that doesn't have much of a practical outcome. Professor Anton van der Meer, molecular immunologist, University of Oxford, comments on this affair, recombining, risks recombining the two variants. Well, so when you infect a single organism, you're going to get the same cell infected with both variants at the same time. You've got the risk of recombination, potentially giving rise to a new strain of virus based on the previous two, but maybe more pathogenic may be more uh, transmissible. Just in the same way, you can have two parents with a particular characteristic who would give rise to a child with a somewhat unexpected characteristic because of this recombination of the genetics. It's almost like sexual reproduction in viruses. It's not quite that, but it's, it's kind of similar. But the risks are similar. So risks recombining the two variants, simple statement of fact from Professor uh, Anton van der Meer. Um, to produce something more lethal. So he agrees, potentially something more lethal. Infected scientists could simply walk out of the lab. So if scientists were infected, then they would walk out, potentially, ca carrying the infection with them. Um, no one seems to really have thought of that, or have they? Uh, it's it's rather, rather bemusing. Uh, Professor van der Meer says... Um, Coronaviruses like SARS coronavirus 2 are well known to evolve by exchanging genetic material, which is what we've said. When two distinct viruses infect the same cell, this makes it much more likely that the two strains will recombine and create a more dangerous variant which could infect those doing the experiments who could then spread into the community, spread this into the community. And using Delta and Omicron, he says, were particularly risky because they're from different lineages with significant differences between the two variants. So the potential was here, 
This research, as we say, paid for by the UK Health Security Agency, carried out in the middle of, well, I don't know if it's the middle of London, but Imperial College London. Um, presumably, we don't know exactly when, but during, during the pandemic, we assume towards the end of Delta, the beginning of uh, the Omicron era. And I wonder which one's going to win out. Isn't this... Yeah, anyway, um, I'm, looking, I'm looking out for the paper on this, so when the paper comes out, we will report on it. And then I'm sure we'll learn all the really good scientific rationales for why this experiment was carried out once the peer-reviewed document is in the public domain. I hope. Uh, Professor and, uh, Anton van der Meer goes on. There's more opportunity for recombination in animal experiments and selection for more dangerous variants because they involve more cells infected for longer periods. Now, he's also talking about some research carried out in Germany. So it's not clear to me at the moment whether the Imperial College research paid for by or sponsored by the UK Health Security Agency involved animal studies or not, or whether it was cell cultures. Not clear on that at the moment, but it remains true that if an animal is infected, then you've got trillions of cells in it. Well, how many cells? Many billions of cells in an animal, of course. And um, more cells could potentially be co-infected at the same time. Therefore, he says the risks are greater, which makes, I must say, makes uh, perfect sense to me. Uh, and the cells can be infected for longer, greater numbers of cells infected for longer periods. Handling animals is also a riskier in terms of transmission to the experimenters than handling cells, which of course is true. Um, neither of these experiments are of any help in protecting us from SARS coronavirus too. So um, the professor here is saying, look, these experiments didn't protect us against SARS coronavirus too but paid for by the UK Health Security Agency, carried out at Imperial College London. And yet, he's quite clear, uh, neither of these experiments are of any help in protecting us from SARS coronavirus too. And I must say, I can't remember any dramatic improvement during that time. In fact, what I remember is Omicron completely uh, took off and infected massive numbers of people throughout the country. So the question has to be asked, why are government agencies paying for high-risk research, potentially high-risk research, which is also probably useless. <laughs> you know, it's always a risk-benefit analysis. OK, there's some risky research here, but it's got massive benefit. But this doesn't appear to be the case. Risky research with no apparent benefit. It's a lose-lose situation. Who is taking these decisions and why? is the question, because it doesn't make any sense to me, unless they know something I don't. They're welcome to come and tell us, of course. Neither of these experiments are of any help in protecting us against SARS coronavirus too. Uh, Dr. Lentos, uh, Centre for Science and Security Studies, King College, King's College London, who wrote this uh, critical report. Uh, there's been a global boom in constructing labs handling dangerous uh, pathogens. But this has not been accompanied by sufficient biosafety and biosecurity oversight for the King's College London report. So I'm quite happy to predict, well, not happy, I'm distraught to predict that the next pandemic, I think, is by far and away most likely to be a lab leak from people dabbling with things they don't understand, to put it quite bluntly, or are unable to control. I mean, there's, there's that. Of course, there's the encroachment of, of humanity into animal areas. There's the abuse of animals. There's the monoculture of animals. All those things are there. And of course, there could be fresh zoonotic spread as we encroach into more and more animal habitats and force animals to uh, cohabit with us in completely unnatural ways. Um, all those are risks and all those things should be addressed and should be stopped. We need to close these wretched wet markets. We need to stop this appalling monoculture of tens of thousands of animals all being essentially genetically the same, very similar, if not the same. We, we need to get a grip on all this, but I still think the most, likely, the most likely thing for the next pandemic will be a lab leak. And this is a serious risk. And what is particularly annoying is, in this case, my tax money paid for it. Uh, who is making these decisions? So that's the King's College. Uh, now, Imperial College of London, of course, barked back this government-backed research. So they're saying it's government-backed. So if it's government-backed, it must be OK, mustn't it? I'm afraid a few things have been government-backed that aren't OK, by any means are not OK. 
This government-backed research uses viruses more, uh, no more pathogenic than those already in circulation within the population and will provide critical insights that support government decision-making on how to manage the pandemic. Well, as we've seen, my opinion on that is highly divided and I know of no decision-making in the pandemic that was infected. Infected, that's a slip of the tongue, isn't it? That, that was affected by this, by this uh, research. It was conducted in a biosafety level three laboratory in line with strict government regulations and received ongoing approval from the health and safety executive. Phew, what a relief. The health and safety executive were involved. God, I thought that could have been a problem for a minute there. OK, so that's this is what Imperial College London are saying, of course. All right, there we go. Now, I did check on this. Remember, this research in London in Imperial College was carried out in a biosecure biolab three level. And of course, one is the weakest, two is the next, three is more rigorous and four is the most rigorous. But this is OK in the Imperial College London because it was carried out in a, in, a, in a level three laboratory. Now, I wanted to clarify my understanding of these. So I went to this website here, biosafety levels, one, two, three and four. What's the difference? Check it out for yourself. Uh, interesting website. And Wuhan, <laughs> Wuhan <laughs> Institute of Virology, uh, bio safety level four so the wuhan institute of virology where sars coronavirus 2 may or may not have leaked from now this we've looked at evidence that it did uh, of course it's not conclusive it's we still don't know but that's level four so that's actually technically in theory <laughs> a more secure laboratory than the um the imperial college one and yet we have our suspicions, don't we, about the leak from this uh, biosafety level for laboratory in Wuhan. Um, and the one in London is technically less secure than that. But this level four biosecurity lab is one of 59 around the world. Three quarters are in urban settings. So this is what I'm saying. If the virus escapes and 75% and of these biosecure level four labs where they're conducting the most dangerous research on the most dangerous pathogens... If it gets out, then bang, it's in the middle of a city. Wow. Millions of people could be infected within days. And all we need is a virus with a potentially incubation period of, say, three or four days. And in three or four days, three or four million people can be infected and try and stop that if you don't live in China. Or even worse, we could have a virus with a very high uh, pathogenicity, a virus that kills a high proportion of those that are infected, very high infection fatality rate, and a long incubation period, potentially. So if the incubation period was seven, eight, nine, ten days, just think of the hold that virus could get. We really need to get a grip, as the King's College report says, on these research institutions. So delighted to see that King's College is, is on the ball with this and published this, this uh, paper. Past lab leaks include smallpox, swine flu, SARS coronavirus 1, anthrax, foot and mouth disease. These have leaked from labs in the past. This is a very serious matter. Labs that were thought to be secure have been responsible for the leaks of smallpox, swine flu, SARS coronavirus 1, that is, 2002-2003 outbreak, anthrax, which is a remarkably nasty disease, foot and mouth disease, affecting uh, primarily cattle. Report by King's College. Do check it out. It's a very good report, actually. Very interesting. That's it there. 59 labs around the world handle the deadliest pathogens. Only a quarter score high on safety. Um, doesn't sound great, does it, at the moment? Um, did the SARS coronavirus 2 result from a high-risk research gone wrong? The King's College report asks, well, in a sense, it may or may not. We don't know. But the King's College report clearly states the risk of future pandemics originated from research with dangerous pathogens is real. This is not uh, a theoretical risk. It's happened before, for sure. Whether it happened in Wuhan, we're probably never going to get a definitive answer, but we've looked at many uh, instances on this channel where the evidence seems to be accumulating. And certainly some American uh, intelligence ages, uh, agencies believe that's the balance of probabilities. So it's a real risk. These biosecurity level four labs, uh, don't worry, 
um, there is one near you. Um, 25 in Europe, 14 in North America, 13 in Asia, 4 in Australia, 3 in Africa. And there is the graph or the map of the world where they are located. So rest assured, wherever you live, scientists are conducting high risk research in biosecurity level 4 labs uh, for your uh, safety. We would hope. We would hope for your safety. Wuhan Institute of Virology, by the way, just to finish, is the largest <laughs> level four lab in the world at the moment. Although there is one going to take over in Texas, uh, not in Texas, in the States somewhere, I can't remember where. But the Wuhan's got 3,000 cubic meters of space and it's the largest one in the world at the moment. And we know it was doing research on um, bat coronaviruses. So there you are. Um, we're not political on this channel, but really politicians need to be involved in this. We need to make our politicians aware that there is a real risk here from very dangerous research being carried on in environments that have leaked in the past and I fear will leak in the future. But why do we have to have such risky, potentially self-destructive behaviours. But this one could be dealt with by... It's a pity we don't have an international health-related organisation, actually, that could supervise this. You know, you know, some sort of health organisation for the world that was actually supervising health for the world. Or a group of uh, nations which were united and were supervising these sort of things internationally. Would be a good idea. Maybe should someone should start with some of those things. But for now, um, as an individual, it's hard to know what to do about it, really. But I think I just wanted to make this more aware, more people more aware of this. Um, do write to politicians, tell them that we're concerned, that we'd rather not have another pandemic. Thank you very much. Especially just to satisfy some academic curiosity or some funding requirement. We'll leave it there, and uh, thank you for watching.